Movie footage used in the kill count is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Dead Meat makes no claim of ownership and simply uses the footage for purposes of education, commentary, and criticism under fair use. Please support filmmakers and the art of filmmaking by watching The Purge Anarchy in its entirety on home media or streaming services where available. Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at The Purge, Anarchy. Anarchy? How you say? How you- Oh, Anarchy! Released in 2014, just one year after the original Purge movie. While the first Purge film followed a single well-off family bunkered down inside their house, Anarchy pulls back to show us a much bigger picture overall, following various characters of more meager means and moving all throughout the city of Los Angeles on Purge night. The result is a much more kinetic and interesting film, buttressed by a solid cast that even includes much Michael K. Williams of The Wire fame. But as far as the kills go, it's just like the first one in that it's a whole bunch of people getting shot. Here, I'll show you. The movie begins by reminding us of how life under Purge is, then it jumps around to introduce the characters we'll be following. First, Sergeant Leo Barnes, who's gearing up to go on a personal mission against the man who killed his son in an accident, but walked free because of a prosecution error. Sounds like a real slow-ass motherfucking Jeff situation we got going on here. Then there's Liz and Shane, a couple played by real-life spouses Keely Sanchez and Zach Guilford. Liz and Shane have recently decided to separate, although Shane is having second thoughts about it. Finally, there's waitress Ava, who has a shitty job alongside her friend Tanya that they don't get out of until there's only two hours left before the purge begins. Ava walks home, where she gets harassed by her nasty landlord, Diego. Take me up there with you tonight, get a little protection, you know what I'm saying? Come on, man. Waiting for her in her apartment is her father, Rico, who's sick and needs medicine they can barely afford, and her daughter, Callie, who's a big fan of this anti-purge activist, Carmelo, that she watches online. Carmelo argues that the purge isn't an outlet for rage, it's a way to kill poor people as population control. He also says it's time to stop that shit. This year, we will fight back! Papa Rico tells his girls that he's checking in early for the night, but after telling them he loves them dearly, he doffs a fancy cap and sneaks outside, where he gets into a limousine waiting for him. Hey buddy, if you can't afford your medicine, what are you doing taking a limo around town, huh? After picking up some groceries, Liz and Shane get harassed in the parking lot by some cottonmouth kings just waiting for Purge time to start. The gang's leader is this friendly fella named Young Ghoulface. Can't wait for his new album to drop. The couple has a well-framed argument that accents their impending separation, and then their car messes up, causing them to pull over. They get out to find the root of their mechanic issues, and listen all of y'all, it was sabotage. And the saboteurs were young Ghoulface and his ice cream truck gang. With purge time drawing nigh, Shane and Liz take off on foot. The same emergency broadcast from the first film plays as Ava and Callie watch at home. Leo listens to the same broadcast on the radio, while he drives around in this pretty cool budget Batmobile. Liz and Shane, however, are stuck on the streets downtown, as those loud purge sirens begin blaring. Would not want to be them, cause we see all the various ways people are going to be spending the night. Sniping from rooftops, walking around in gangs, driving around around in murder buses? This kind of shit is what the first film was missing. There are even murder semi-trucks, and the first kills of the film happen when one of them pulls alongside a pair of pedestrians, and this dude Big Daddy, who will be the movie's big baddie, opens fire on them with a machine gun. Leave it to a dude dressed like a patriotic butcher to really streamline the killing process during the purge. Leo drives by some scenes of carnage, including a dude getting beaten to death on the side of the road, who I will go ahead and add onto the list. I'll also add this dude who Liz and Shane see get dropped from an upper floor of the building, cause he's screaming as he falls, and then is Scream stops. Sounds like a dead man to me. I'll also count this body they run into while trying to hide in a dumpster, since it looks pretty immobile and bloody. Although it could just be a sleepy homeless man who just got done drinking bottomless Bloody Mary somewhere. Ava and Callie get ready for a purge night dinner, but when Callie goes to get her grandpapa, she finds a letter that he left them saying he doesn't want to burden them anymore with his expensive medical problems, so he's agreed to be a martyr for a wealthy family. They'll transfer a hundred grand to Ava's account in exchange for getting to kill Rico and release the beast from the safety of their home. The kill ultimately happens off screen but it'll still go on the list. You don't hang that many tarps up and not kill a dude, you know? Callie's understandably upset and wants to go save her grandpa, but Ava knows that it's too late and that this is the way this world works. Oh, hold on. The movie cuts back to Leo driving around and we see a body in the street that I have to add to the count. Man, while all these people are dealing with their lives, there are dead bodies everywhere. Ava and Callie get their grieving interrupted by the sound of a Mack truck pulling up outside, and from their window, they see a ton of armored soldier-looking dudes approaching their building. That's about to be an issue for sure, but there's also a more immediate threat breaking into their apartment. It's fucking Diego, that asshole from downstairs, who is of course threatening these women with rape. Tonight, I'm gonna release the beast! It's my right! Okay, dude, but maybe clear your throat first so it doesn't hurt to hear you speak. It's my night to motherfucking purge! 
Or not, that's cool too. Luckily, the only thing this gross motherfucker is able to do is lick Ava's face before he hears someone else entering the apartment and gets shot to pieces. That trademark CGI purge blood spurting out of all his bullet wounds. Hasta luego, Diego. The assailants are, of course, the armored men they saw outside, and these guys grab the ladies and radio to Big Daddy downstairs that they found exactly what he was looking for. As they drag the ladies from their homes, we see a number of bodies along the way, and see the kidnappers shooting at someone off screen, who I'm certain they didn't miss. All in all, another five kills are added to the count. The one person shot off screen and four visible bodies. Big Daddy's children pull the ladies out into the street right as Leo Barnes happens to roll up onto the scene. After seeing them toss Callie to the ground, he begins to have a debate with himself over whether or not he should do something. Just drive, just drive, just drive. But his conscience gets the better of him and he steps outside the safety of his armored car to go make some skull and crossbones. As Leo makes his way to the ladies in distress, Liz and Shane happen to come across his empty car. Seeking safety, they hop inside the back seat right as the semi-truck opens for the Big Daddy bounty. Before they can make the handoff, though, Leo comes from behind and starts gunning these dudes down. Two are killed right off the bat by his rifle, while he kills a third with a bunch of shots from his handgun. He uses the truck for cover to shoot a fourth dude and finish him off with a headshot. Big Daddy comes by to see what's up and gets shot as well, but as we'll see soon, he was not killed. Still, the area is pretty damn secure now, and Leo reluctantly motions for Ava and Callie to come with him if they want to live. When they get back to the car, they find Liz and Shane in the back seat, but despite a bunch of hollering and gun waving, Leo lets them stay when they realize Big Daddy is back up and pretty damn Big Maddie. Leo drives away right as Big Daddy opens fire, hitting the car a whole bunch, but thankfully nobody inside. As they drive past Carrie White standing on the side of the street, Leo asks Ava why armored dudes were at her building, and Liz why the fuck she and Rodrigo Santoro were in those couple episodes of Lost. But when Kelly asks him why he was out on the streets in the first place, he hushes up and refuses to say. Then the car breaks down from Big Daddy's armor-piercing bullets, so Leo has to pull off into an alley. He tries to separate himself from these less capable citizens so he can go take care of his business, but Ava says that she can get him a car to use as long as he can safely deliver them to her friend Tanya's place. He reluctantly agrees to the arrangement. That was a real dick move, you know, walking away and then coming back. Leo leads his new squadron out, and the first thing they run into is a woman on a roof with a megaphone and a rifle. Looks like she's already claimed at least two victims, since we see a couple of bodies lying dead in the street. They avoid the roof lady's rage and then hear a bomb, bomb, bomb coming down the street, where they see young Ghoulface and his ice cream truck gang abduct a dude and drive off with him. And I don't think it's so he can enjoy a blue raspberry screwball. Shane steps off the curb right into a trap that drags him down the street a little ways. This alerts a bunch of attackers, but Leo is able to keep everyone safe after shooting and killing two of the vultures who come out for the easy prey. Shane shoots the trap to free himself, and the group is able to escape down another alley before more purgers show up. The four protagonists who aren't proficient in firearms make proper introductions to each other and express some concern about the man who's protecting them. But maybe they should do it a little quieter. He's out here, armed to the teeth on purge night voluntarily. That means he's trying to do something nasty. I can hear you. Sorry. Callie tries to break through Leo's tough shell, and honestly, the relationship between these two is probably the best part of this movie. I'm guessing you're either a cop or a criminal, huh? I'm guessing you're either a pain in my ass or a pain in my ass. She surmises that he's out and about to get his purge on, but he shuts down the convo before it can go anywhere. I'm gonna stop talking because you're being an asshole, okay? Not because you told me to shut up. As they continue on, they pass by the body of a stockbroker named David, who was killed and strung up in front of a bank, the note around his neck blaming him for lost pensions. The purge movies love to make socioeconomic commentary, even though they never really mastered the art of subtlety. The group rounds another corner to find nine more bodies to add to our list. There are seven on the ground outside that big Mac Daddy semi-truck, one more body barely visible inside, and a ninth guy who jump scares the group before falling to the ground and whispering that they were just doing their duty as he dies. These are the same peeps who invaded Ava's apartment building, and their high-tech monitors inside the truck include live feeds of the city's traffic cams, even though, as Liz points out, traffic cams are controlled by the government. Callie says this truck must be the new founding fathers themselves. A theory further supported by Carmelo's logo painted on the wall, indicating that his group was behind the attack on this big rig. Another semi-truck rounds the corner, and the group hightails it out of there, down yet another alleyway. At the end of this one, they find a couple of burning vehicles and three more dead bodies to add to the kill count. Don't know what happened to the two in the back, but the four ground bodies getting shanked like a motherfucker. Leo sees a subway entrance he'd like to get to, but before they can, Stabby McStaverson finds them behind the wall. Luckily, Leo is able to subdue the guy in a stranglehold and eventually kills him by choking him to death. Hey look, a death that's not from a 
gun shop. The Purge Anarchy is a whole new world, with a fantastic point of view. They wind up down in the subway, and after Callie tells Leo that purging is wrong no matter what, and that killing won't help him with his issues, they find a group of vagrants hiding out from all the violence. Too bad this place is about to get Mad Maxian up in this bitch, with these crazy death dune buggies riding up. The flamethrowing psychopaths at the helm chase down our heroes and the homeless alike, but I only see three deaths that happen for sure. First is a vagrant who's mercilessly gunned down, and then, as if that wasn't enough, run over with the dune buggy. God damn! Another vagrant is shot to death in the background. The third for sure death is one last homeless dude who gets torched with the flamethrower, cause let's be real, if you show someone with a flamethrower, there's gotta be a kill with a flamethrower. It's pretty much the law. Shane and Liz take a stand and shoot at the death buggies as they approach, but Shane takes a shot through the shoulder that puts him down temporarily. The couple manages to rally like a frat boy after day drinking, with Shane shooting the driver and crashing the buggy into the side of the tunnel. Then Liz lands a shot on the flamethrower gas tank and blows the whole thing up. I'll say it killed the three occupants of that first dune buggy, as well as the driver of the one behind them who flies through the flames. With four and a half hours to go, the group makes a desperate run to get to Tanya's house, giving us some cool shots in the process. Some traffic cameras also get a cool shot of the crew and reports to a pair of semis, one of which veers off to go after them. The group gets to Tanya's house and is led into her apartment, where Shane is stitched up and everyone gets some food. Can't wine and dine Leo, though. He's only interested in getting that car, so he can enact his legalized revenge. But Ava is still super against it and breaks some bad news to him. There is no car. Damn, you'd think a guy named Leo would be better attuned to Lion. Tanya's father and brother-in-law get back from checking the building, and things get a little weird, with Tanya's sister Lorraine being pretty mean to her husband, and Tanya telling her to chill. They watch Purge Night on the news, where we had two more people to the kill count when they're shot to death during a Pittsburgh feed. Must have been a couple of Flyers fans. At least all this drama brings Liz and Shane closer together, with her retracting those plans to get separated. When Tanya tries to lighten the mood by playing some music and grabbing her brother-in-law's dick, the only thing she manages to do is piss her sister Lorraine off enough to frickin' murder her. Apparently, Lorraine's husband had been cheating on her with Tanya, and Lorraine decided to put a permanent end to it on Purge Night. A little shootout occurs, but Sergeant Leo Barnes is a pro, and ushers his group of charges out the door to safety. Leo checks outside the building, and finds Big Daddy in the middle of a team huddle with his employees, telling them to kill the fuck out of Leo and save him the women. The group rushes outside and hops over a fence to get away, only to find that the young ghoulface gang is there waiting for him. They knock out Leo, and he awakens to his entire group being held in the back of that ice cream truck. Young ghoulface himself takes off his mask, and hey, holy shit, it's Lakeith Stanfield, who's been having a very well-deserved hell of a career lately. He says they've just been picking up Big Daddy's scraps as a means to make money. Turns out they've been abducting people in their ice cream truck to sell to some fancy customers, and that's exactly what happens to our unfortunate heroes right now. They're all ushered inside and forced to their knees just in time for the curtains to open, and they're the show! They find themselves on stage in front of scores of rich people applauding their presence. This is one of the more intriguing sequences of the film, as a hostess auctions the characters off one by one to the highest bidders in the room. Eventually, they're all sold to these human hunters as the most dangerous game. Purgers? Please suit up. Our protagonists are once again ushered down a hallway and wind up in a dark room called the Hunting Grounds with a couple of other huntees. The hunters have a variety of weapons and night vision goggles to give them an edge, as the rest of the rich folk watch from behind a bulletproof window. The only thing left to do before a meal like this is pray to the new founding fathers. And with that out of the way, the hunt begins. It's a dark scene, but I'll do my best here. We see one body in the background as Leo tells the rest of the gang to stay in place while he tries to gain the upper hand. We do hear a bunch of gunshots go off, but I can't be certain they're all finding their targets. Unless I see them, that is. Like the case with this running dude who shot straight through a wall. Oh yeah! Leo kills his first pair of hunters with the Hearst brothers, two rich heirs whose daddy bought them people to purge. He beats the first brother down a bit before killing him by breaking his neck. Then after the second brother runs out and misses Leo a whole bunch, he is also bested by Mr. Barnes, being taken down and murdered with his own gun. Welcome to the revolution, you bougie bastards! Leo throws on a pair of night vision shades, and we see another three victims to add to the list. One person getting stabbed to death in the far background, and two bodies on the ground separate from the Hearst brothers, possibly victims of all that earlier gunfire. Leo gets attacked by the Hanover sisters, a pair of huntresses well known for their blade skills, making them the Katana and Melina of the Purge world. After a short fight, he breaks one of their necks against the sculpture, and then, after getting the other on the ground, shoots the second sister as she struggles to get up. He returns to his de facto Purge Knight family and gives them weapons and goggles. Together, he and Liz shoot another hunter, Papa Hearst, as he approaches them in his stupid hunting outfit. You wore the wrong kind of vest, dude. But these rich people don't like to play by the rules, cause 
because, you know, they're rich people. So they turn on the lights and call in a team of fixers to clean this mess up. While the group despairs over their new odds, Shane gets lit up by a whole bunch of bullets by a dude who Leo immediately returns fire on and kills. Unfortunately, this lightning strike kills Shane, which has really got to suck for Liz, seeing as their relationship was just on the men. It's actually an emotional moment in a series that usually has a hard time creating them, so good job, Anarchy. Some alarms go off to warn the rich people that Omar coming! After a flash grenade is thrown and blows up, three security guards get gunned down, but not by Carmelo himself. Instead, it's by one of his men, who we know from the original Purge and that French Algerian beach, because it's the stranger, motherfucker! He and the rest of Carmelo's movement burst into the hunting grounds and quickly dispatch of another couple hired guns dressed like waiters. Hope the paycheck was worth it, guys. With the battle underway, Carmelo makes his grand entrance. Fuck you! Fuck your money! And motherfuck the purge! Callie fangirls over him for a minute since she wasn't able to see him at VidCon, and then Leo tries to get his remaining group to go. But Liz is too upset about Shane's death. I want to purge. So, after the stranger promises to take care of her, Leo, Ava, and Callie run out, with Leo still determined to take his revenge. Carmelo's forces arm Liz and begin a forward assault, really putting the pro and proletariat as they gun down another couple of waiter dudes fighting for the bourgeois. Leo hijacks a car in the parking garage, and even though there's less than an hour left to the purge, he's convinced he can still make it, so he speeds off as day breaks over Los Angeles. When he arrives at his final destination, he tells his companions what we've already surmised, that the dude inside this house, Warren Grass, was a drunk driver who killed his son but got off on a technicality. But after everything we've seen this movie, I think it's safe to say that that is the only thing Leo Barnes and slow-ass motherfucking Jeff have in common. Callie tries one last time to convince Leo not to do this, but he snaps at her and tells the ladies to stay in the car while he goes inside. Having disabled the security system discreetly last week, Leo goes to wake up Warren gently with a nice little nuzzle. Er, muzzle. A gun muzzle. He throws Warren across the floor and even does the same to Warren's wife, then yells at Warren for what he did while Warren's wife pleads to let him go. After a lot of crazy yelling from Leo, the scene ends? and it cuts to outside the house where Leo steps into the sunshine with blood all over his face. But ain't no time to enjoy that vitamin D when you're getting shot twice like Leo does. The shots that knocked his ass to the ground came from who else? Big fucking daddy, who followed Leo to this obvious location after learning who he was from his license plate. Big D tells Leo that there's an unwritten rule of the purge. Don't save lives. Tonight we take lives. We make things manageable. For us. He says that since citizens haven't been killing each other enough, the NFFA has resorted to killing people themselves in order to keep the poverty levels down. Since Leo tried to be a hero, Big Daddy's gonna have to kill him. Blessed be America. A nation reborn. And then he gets shot in the head. Yeah, I mean, we all pretty much figured this would happen, but did you know Warren Grass would be the one to pull the trigger? Oh, you did? Since you rightfully assumed Leo didn't actually kill him when the scene cut away? Okay, that's fair. Ava, Callie, and Big Daddy's men all arrive on the scene super armed, but then loud sirens blare, signaling the end of Purge 2023. Together, Ava and Callie load Leo into Warren's car, and Leo and Callie hold hands in the back seat as Warren pulls up to a hospital. The movie ends with a card advertising the next Purge, like it's goddamn Christmas or something. I guess these movies are like Christmas for those of you who like big numbers, so let's unstuff some stockings and get to them. Sixty-five people died during the Purge Anarchy, a new second place record. Again, gender distribution is hard to know for sure, but I think we wound up with 54 men and 6 women with 5 kills I just couldn't discern. That makes, uh, this pie chart. Yay, pie charts! With a runtime of 103 minutes, we had a kill on average every 1.58 minutes. Purge can't stop, won't stop. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the homeless guy who gets lit ablaze, since I always love a good fire stunt. And, you know, it's not somebody getting shot. Doll machete for lamest kill can be a uh, homeless dumpster guy, sure. And that's it. The Purge Anarchy came out in 2014 and helped establish the franchise as a big name in contemporary horror. The series would get even more zeitgeisty with 2016's The Purge Election Year, which is up next Friday. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Michael Nicholson and John Lechner III. Oh, you fancy, huh? I just got back from a four-day trip to Vegas to celebrate my dad's birthday, and in two days I'll be going down to VidCon for three days. That is a lot of days not to be working when I usually spend every day working. So on Sunday, instead of a new video, I'm just going to do a live stream of Alien Isolation. Be good people.